It's yours. Thanks, Joseph. Great to talk to you again. Thanks for having me back. Uh, today, I'm going to tell you about what we call Sim AI. I'm hoping that name catches because uh, I want to trademark it. But it's basically the concept of using synthetic or simulated data sets to train artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithms. And uh, I'll walk you through one case that we did at OnScale. It wasn't me. It was one of my engineers. So don't ask me any tough questions. But it was, it's a pretty cool case of using simulated data to train an AI algorithm that uh, you know could go onto an embedded platform and control some physical sensors. Uh, before I get there, though, I'd like to tell you a little bit about, about myself. I'm a Georgia Tech trained engineer. I was in the aerospace systems design laboratory at Georgia Tech where we built UAVs. And we also used AI and machine learning algorithms way back then, this is back in uh, 2008, uh, to both engineer the aircraft that we built, we built UAVs, and also to fly UAVs. So that was a pretty cool experience. Um, I founded Next Input in 2012. Next Input is a, an award-winning MEMS touch technology company with my co-founder, Ryan Dieselhorst. We started at Tech, actually, using a bunch of the labs at Georgia Tech to develop the first generations of our sensors. I wish I'd had SIM API and cloud-based multi-physics back then, because I probably could have gotten to market a lot faster. But regardless, we were pretty successful, we raised a bunch of money, and then Next Input was acquired by Corvo, a big sensor company that makes all sorts of different sensors. And I think today there are many Next Input sensors in things like Tesla vehicles uh, to replace buttons and mechanical switches in things like automotive applications. So pretty proud of that company. And then as part of my experience at Next Input, we were using ANSYS and ComSol and SOLIDWORKS simulation, you know, all these different multi-physics simulation packages. And we dreamed about being able to run simulations on the cloud, you know, using cloud supercomputers, basically infinite compute power. You couldn't do that back then, you know, in uh, the early 2010s. So I found it on scale to do that in 2017. OnScale is a cloud engineering simulation platform. It was also a startup company, so we raised a bunch of money in Silicon Valley, and then it was acquired by Ansys this year. Uh, and then now we're becoming Ansys' uh, cloud simulation capability, and I'm leading the team. All the on-scalers came over with me. We're leading this revolution within Ansys. And the cool thing about being a part of Ansys is Ansys has the world's best multi-physics solvers, so we're starting to put those into the on-scale platform. And what we're building essentially is, if I can go to the next slide, Jarvis. Do you like the Iron Man movies, Joseph? Every I definitely does. do, yeah. yeah. Of course. Yeah, every, that is your favorite, every engineer's favorite superhero. I like him, Tony Stark, because he doesn't have any actual superpowers. His superpower is engineering. And he has this computer called Jarvis supercomputer with AI and multi-physics. And he uses that to help him build his Iron Man suits and a bunch of other really cool tech. So I think of ourselves as you know building Jarvis today. Let me tell you how that works. We're taking uh, powerful, proven multi-physics solvers, and now we've got access to the whole uh, uh, ANSYS portfolio. Oops, I'm trying to get rid of this thing. Well, I guess it's gonna stay there. Anyway, we've got powerful multi-physics solvers, and now we have access to ANSYS's portfolio of every multi-physics solver you could possibly think of. Uh, we've built the cloud simulation platform that uses cloud supercomputers to 
execute this software. And we do it in a really intelligent way where we will look at the uh, simulation setup, the, the multi-physics that you're trying to solve, and we'll pick the, the cloud compute that you need to solve that simulation or set of simulations. It could be thousands and thousands of simulations running in parallel. And now we're combining that with an AI and ML engine that we use to do things like estimate how many CPU cores and how much memory you need for a given simulation study. But also we're we're making this a feature for engineers to be able to use uh, AI to guide their engineering process and also use uh, artificial intelligence or, or use their simulation data rather to train artificial intelligence machine learning algorithms. And that's a really cool capability that I'm particularly excited about. That's what I'm going to talk to you guys about today. So in traditional R&D, you know, I know there's a bunch of engineers on the line today, and this would be a very familiar process for most engineers. When you're engineering something, you'll start with a, a model, a CAD model, or you know, a PCB layout or whatever it could be eCAD to. You'll import that into your favorite sim tool. I hope it's on scale, but if it's not, go check it out. Uh, in this example, this is an on-shape uh, 3D model, CAD model. We've got a direct connection to on shape, so you, you can design your CAD model in a web browser, and then you can simulate it in a web browser. You don't need any local software to do this. Then you will parameterize the simulations. Usually you have parametric CAD too, so you have variables in your CAD that you can change uh, to tweak the CAD model. And then you can also parameterize the simulation inputs, things like the loads, constraints, materials, all of that stuff. We've got a pretty slick uh, scripting language based in Python called Sim API that you can use to script a lot of this. And then you'll look at the results of your simulation and you'll see if this design works or if it doesn't work, you know, you go back to the drawing board and you'll iterate around this uh, many, many times until you've got an ideal design. That's all well and good. You know that this process has worked for engineers for a long time, but now we can start bringing in uh, AI to really keep things up a notch. Uh, Sim AI is a game-changing integrated multi-physics and AI machine learning platform. Uh, this is just one example. This is the example that I'll, I'll talk about today, training embedded AI using simulated data sets. But there are many use cases of combining multi-physics simulation and AI machine learning. This is just one example. In the example I'm going to tell you today, or tell you about, uh, we're going to go through a simulation process. So we're going to set up a parametric simulation, a, a whole suite of simulations that we're going to run. We're going to collect uh, simulated data sets. So this is data that mimics uh, physical data that we can then use to train AI. We can look and see if the uh, if the AI that we've trained is performance or not. If it's not performant, we can we can run some more simulations, get some more data. If it is performant, we can say yes. We'll embed this onto a uh, embedded microcontroller and actually put this into a system, and then we can start filtering in uh, physical data once we've got our AI algorithm embedded in an actual product. We can collect you know, real physical data from products that are out in the field and start using that data to retrain our AI algorithm. So this is a really a, uh, a recursive type of approach here where we're starting off with an AI trained purely on simulated data, and then we're bringing in physical data over time. And as we all know, AI machine learning algorithms love data. They need lots and lots of data. The more data you have, the better your AI machine learning algorithm is going to perform. And there's two ways to get data. You can either simulate or you can do it the old fashioned way by building a bunch of prototypes and you know, collecting physical data. We think that in the future, engineers will do much more simulation and then you know, use real products to get the physical data 
that'll allow them to get to market faster and reduce risk, cost, and time to market. So the case study I want to show you today is training an embedded AI for a 3D touch sensing application. So this comes from my experience at Next Input, where we were making touch systems for smartphones, smartphones, wearables, automotive applications, whatever. And all of the uh, touch systems that we created used our MIMS device. So there's these tiny MIMS sensors that would go underneath a, uh, a touch surface. It could be a piece of glass or an OLED or whatever, it doesn't matter. And these sensors only sense one axis of force. So you can think of them as like a, a little mini weight scale. If you put a force onto the sensor, it will read out uh, an analog signal that can then be converted to a digital signal inside of a microcontroller. And then it can be used to interpolate uh, 3D touch points, X, Y, and then the amount of force that you're applying uh, to the touch surface. So this is a pretty simple example. This is a simple example that uses four sensors. We had systems that used dozens of sensors in some cases in a, in a touch surface. Uh, but let's talk about how we can simulate this first. So we will generate a synthetic or simulated data sets to train AI. First, we'll build a mock-up in a 3D CAD. We use Onshape to do that. Within Onshape, we parameterized uh, the touch inputs. So we had a, an array of touch inputs across that touch surface. Then we brought the CAD model into Onscale. We meshed it. And then we would put a, a force at each of those touch points. So imagine that this force you know, would be applied at different points along the touch surface. Each one of those creates its own simulation. So I don't know what the array size here is. It's uh, five by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, some 45 touch points. We would have 45 simulations. And before on scale, you know, if I were doing this on a desktop using, uh, let's say, ComSol or you know, SolidWorks simulation on a desktop, uh, I would have to run 45 simulations serially, one after the other. But because we've got on scale, we're going to run, we can run all 45 of them simultaneously. And also we'll run them with different forces. So we'll go from one Newton to 10 Newtons in one Newton increments. So we'll actually end up with 450 simulations. But again, that doesn't matter. We're going to run them in parallel on the cloud and we'll get data back very quickly to train our AI algorithm. Uh, just to kind of show you that process, so this is the, the CAD model. I'm going to import it from Onshape. I'll kind of speed this up a little bit so you don't have to watch it in real time. Uh, we've got a bunch of positions. Those are those 45 uh, touch points. We import the CAD, uh, tell it what units we want. There it is. Then we pick a material. We're going to pick glass. Uh, I'll pause it here for a second. So the CAD model is parametric. So the configurations that we brought in, this circle, this face will move around you know, to, to capture those 45 touch points. So all we have to do is set up the simulation once. And we're going to put a force load on that circle. We do this one time and then parameterize it. And then we've got 450 simulations that will run, even though we just set up this simulation once, which is pretty cool. There's our sensors. The sensors will be simple restraints. And when we create a restraint, we have the ability to query that point. It creates a, a sensor within our simulation environment. And we can know what the reaction forces are at those four points. And that's important because we, that, that's actually simulating what the, the sensors themselves will experience, the force that they will experience. Uh, we'll create a mesh that this, this runs a mesh convergence study behind the scenes. So we always get a really nice mesh. I'll show you what that looks like. Maybe I won't. We'll run the simulation. In this case, we're running 45 simulations in parallel on the cloud. 
speed this up a little bit. And then we'll look at some results. So here's that study. Uh, we can look at displacement stress strain, and we can also look at the reaction forces at those sensors. And the nice thing about all of this is, so this is the output of one, uh, the first touch point, and I'll just cycle through them. So you kind of see that there's a third touch point, fourth touch point. Unfortunately, the CAD model doesn't update, so the touch point appears to stay in the same spot. But trust me, we've got all the data there from all 45 touch points. And I can use a Jupyter notebook to go uh, query the reaction forces. So here's the results of all of the simulations, all 45 simulations. And then I wrote a little script that creates a data set of the output. And with that data set, then I can train my AI. So this is what that looks like, the, all those different touch points across the surface. And I've got a simulated data set for each one of those touch points. Now, I can plot them, obviously. So this is what the sensor in the top left corner looks like, in the, in the top right corner, bottom left corner, bottom right corner. And it creates this uh, response surface. This is for one force. So this is at one newtons. But we did this for uh, between 0 and 10 newtons, actually one in 10 newtons. So we actually had uh, 450 uh, points of data that we can then train our, our algorithm against. Um, we did this for a, a larger screen and many more sensors. So I presented the, the four sensor version just so you conceptually understand how we simulated and got the reaction forces at each sensor. But what I'm going to show you next is how we did this in, for a more practical example that's got multiple different sensors in it, eight sensors in this case. And then we trained our AI using the simulation data that we collected. Uh, we used a, a shallow regression network. We have one network for each variable. The variables were, the inputs were uh, the force forces at each of those points. You know, the eight force sensors, and then the X, Y, and F inputs from the uh, simulations. Um, the size was we had an input layer, six hidden layers, output layer. If you want, you can uh, read a case study about this to get more details on the actual AI, AI algorithm that we used. We scaled them all. So we had like a standard unit, zero mean. And our data set was from 8,000 sims in this case. And then we randomized the 3D touch points. We had 15% of the uh, simulation data set reserved for validation and 15% reserved for testing. We ran all of these simulations in hours instead of days or weeks for minimal cost. I think the entire cost of the study was like a few hundred dollars. And if we've been trying to collect this data set the old fashioned way using physical prototypes, it would have taken months, maybe years, and it would have taken you know tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars to get a physical data set. We used um, Bayesian regular regularization back propagation. We did a validation score. And the, once we reached the score that we wanted, it terminated the training. And the one thing that we didn't do that would be really cool is actually start off with a smaller number of simulations and run this back propagation and validation to see if we're getting a performant AI. And then if we're not actually running more simulations, in this case, we kind of brute forced it. So we don't know if uh, we could have gotten away with fewer simulations to achieve a working AI, but we now have the capability of doing that. So if we're not getting the, uh, the performance AI algorithm that we expect. We could just run more simulations and further train it and then, you know, do the validation testing, make sure we're getting the performance that we want. Uh, these are the training results for that 8,000 simulation case. Again, eight sensors. And these are the results for predicting the X coordinate of a touch point 
the y coordinate of a touch point and the force or z axis of a touch point. And you can see it's the AI algorithm is pretty good at predicting x and y. And then it's a little less good at predicting force, but it does predict force within a, a reasonable level of accuracy. Got an R, R value of uh, 0.99, which is really acceptable to me. And this algorithm is could go onto a uh, embedded system, could go into that phone and work just fine. And again, we, we train this within you know, hours, maybe a couple of days to run through the whole study. And if we were to do this the old fashioned way, it would have taken a huge amount of time. So how does it work? Let's take a look. Here, here we're gonna use the AI algorithm to put in actual touch points and see how well it predicts, uh, it does a prediction of where that touch point is. So there you go. This is that one force level, I should note. And this is again, a simulation of the AI doing its work. But you can see it does a pretty good job. And I'm pretty confident that if, if we were actually to take this algorithm, put it on a microcontroller, put it into that physical smartphone, it would work just like this. Also, I want to tell you a little bit about our, our roadmap. So what I showed you was uh, kind of like explore slash guided engineering. Uh, but to walk through the roadmap, we first started out in 2021 with an estimator. This is an AI, or more correctly, a, a machine learning estimator that looks at all of the simulations that are run on OnScale and predicts how much memory and compute power the next simulation will require. And our algorithm gets better and better. It's, uh, it's training itself on every simulation that you run on non-scale. We don't look at your CAD data or your outputs. We just look at uh, metadata, like the number of degrees of freedom, you know, which is driven by the mesh density and the type of physics that you've applied and various other algorithms. And then we spit out the runtime, four hours of RAM that's required. And that's how we select what type of computer to run your simulations on. This is kind of a done deal. We delivered that in 2021, and it's working really well. In 2022, we're doing more of the what I call the Explorer, where you've got simulated data, and you're interpolating KPIs, or you're you know, using simulated data to train AI to do stuff like what I just showed you. In 2023, we're going to be rolling out a guided engineering approach that looks at previous simulations. And then it looks at how engineers are using the simulation results to see if the simulation results are what they expect. And then we're feeding that back into an AI engine that will help guide engineers to correct simulation setups and hopefully eliminate GIGO, which is garbage in, garbage out. Any engineer that's been doing simulation for any amount of time knows that you can very easily uh, put in the incorrect simulation inputs or the wrong type of mesh and you get just garbage output. So guided engineering will help eliminate that. In the very near future, you'll be able to run unsupervised engineering. This is advanced generative design where all you do is put in the design constraints of an engineer device and it will spit out optimal designs and that's pretty cool we've got apis that can drive on shape cad and of course apis that can drive simulation inputs so you tie those apis to uh, an ai algorithm tell it what you want to achieve and it basically designs stuff for you and then this is kind of a joke, but in the future, there will be computers designing computers. There will be Jarvis or Skynet. I'm hoping it turns out to be Jarvis and not Skynet, if you're a Terminator fan. But that'll be uh, computer-generated inputs and then you know computers designing computers, which would be really cool. All right, so what are our takeaways? What have we learned today? We used simulation and AI, what we call sim AI. You can use simulated data sets to train robust AI. 
And ultimately, that's going to help you save time, save money, reduce risk for whatever you're, uh, whatever you're designing. On-scale cloud is the only way to do this. You have to have a cloud supercomputer and cloud multi-physics. You have to have a cloud simulation platform in order to do sim AI the right way, or else you're just going to waste a lot of time. And the applications are numerous. I, sh I showed you one application, which is training AI using simulated data sets for embedded AI, but you could use it for design space exploration, generative design, all sorts of different really cool applications. And then we're working on ways to actually execute the cloud simulations and train the AI from the same Jupyter notebook. The Jupyter notebook that I showed you will give you access to all of your simulation data today. However, it's it's kind of a boxed in. You can't go and you know load in uh, the SageMaker API, for example, from AWS. But in the very near future, you're going to have more of a a sandbox to bring in the AI algorithms you want, and you know run a bunch of simulations train AI on the simulated data, all from the same Jupyter notebook, which would be super cool. If you want to get started, you can get started today. You can go to onscale.com. You can create a free account. You can look at some of our examples. You can start running simulations and potentially training AI this afternoon if you want to. So that's it. At this point, I'll turn it over for uh, any questions that we might have. I don't know if there's a way to see questions here. I think there are questions right now. I said the same thing, didn't I? <laughs> um, could you give us a maybe, because we have some time left, a walkthrough or a little bit of a demo of the platform? Oh, yeah, sure. Sure, let me uh, share bring up a browser here. Can you guys still see my screen? Yep, it works. Wait, that's not it. Saul.portal.com. So this is going to start in my uh, portal. Let's see if we've got some projects. I'll create a new project for you. These are all my projects. Um, I can share them very easily. I can manage my core hours. Core hours is our currency, if you will, for simulation. So I've consumed three and a half thousand core hours and I've got 22,000 core hours available to me. And before I run a simulation, it'll tell me how many core hours uh, my simulation study will cost me. So let's do a swing arm, it's my favorite CAD model. I'm gonna import CAD, I'm gonna go to Onshape. So here's our Onshape plugin. I think it's gonna ask me to log into Onshape. Yep, log into Onshape. Onshape is my favorite CAD package because I was a huge SOLIDWORKS fan and Onshape was created by the SOLIDWORKS guys and they did a fantastic job. It's 100% web-based, which is cool. I have a MacBook. Uh, I'm a Mac guy and I always hated having to install Windows on my MacBook just to run SOLIDWORKS. And now I don't have to install anything on my MacBook to, to do engineering. CAD and simulation, which is awesome. So this will take a second. While it's uh, bringing in the CAD model, it's also analyzing the CAD. It's, it's looking at the number of faces, facets, vertices, everything, trying to figure out how best to mesh this thing. So it's already doing some work in the background for me. And that'll help me get to a, a viable mesh much faster than if I were building a mesh manually. This takes way too long, by the way, so we're gonna fix this. By the way, I guess there's also a free plan, right, Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a free plan. I think free plan comes with uh, 10 core hours per month, so that's enough to you know mess around. And uh, it's also easy to upgrade to get more core hours so you can do a lot more parametric simulations. I'll set up a parametric simulation for you. So first thing I'll do is uh, just add some physics. 
don't know why I made that invisible. And if I ever get lost, it's got a little quick guide over here. And I have a massive screen, so I apologize if you guys you know can't see it on your screen. But there's full embedded help there. Uh, so I'll just follow along here. It says apply material. So I'll, I'll apply a material to this thing. Let's make it aluminum. Pretty soon we're going to have uh, some uh, ANSYS material libraries in here. That'll be a very rich set of material libraries or materials, I should say. But if I wanted to, I can go in and change this aluminum to whatever my uh, actual alloy is uh, just by changing the mechanical properties. Let's go to physics and let's put in a restraint. I'm going to restrain this end here. This is a motorcycle swing arm. So this is the rear part of a motorcycle. So I want to know how this thing is going to flex while the rider is cornering and turns. So I'm going to I'm going to mimic that with my simulation. I'm going to fix this part and apply a differential force to where the uh, the rear axle will go. Let's put in I don't know 250 newtons there for that force, and then let's put in a different force, like let's say 100 newtons on this side, because this motorcycle is in a tight turn. And I want to see how this thing flexes. And in fact, I won't uh, put in a fixed value. I'll go in and edit this, and we'll parameterize this. I'll put in a linear sweep. We put a linear sweep, geometric sweep. Pretty soon we'll have the ability to import a CSV file that has all of your different forces that you want to cycle through as part of your simulations. Is cycle it by factor 10 in 10 steps. So that's actually going to yield, now it's going to yield 10 simulations. I could do it to the other one also. And if I put uh, 10 different steps on the other course, I'd have 100 simulations. But I'll just stick with 10 for now. And it should be ready to simulate. So I'm just going to launch this thing. So there's my 10 simulations. It's going to estimate how many core hours those 10 simulations will require. And then once it's done estimating, I'll be able to launch these in parallel. And I'll show you guys how I can access the simulation data to be able to train an AI algorithm. This also takes way too long. Especially uh, really cool, Ian. I would have one question though. Maybe it's like kind of a dumb question, but while it's estimating, is it at the same time once it estimated starting the run, or is it first estimating and then asking you to start the run? It's going to esti first estimate how long this is going to take and what type of computer uh, we should pick on AWS mm -hmm. on a single simulation. So if I've done a much more complicated simulation, this is a basic static mechanical simulation, so it's pretty simple. But I could have thrown in some thermal physics, thermal mechanical physics, and then that drives up the complexity, that drives up the amount of RAM we need, and the number of CPU cores that we need to solve this efficiently. So that's what the estimator is estimating, just how to do this. You know, what, what's okay. the best hardware? Mm -hmm. Is and it estimating and then be... waiting for you to hit run, or is it estimating and then running at the same time? It, it'll estimate and then it'll show me the core hours that it will cost me and then approximately how long it will take. And then I, I have the option to say, you know what? I think I'm gonna go make my simulation less complex because I don't wanna okay. spend the core hours. No. Or you know, maybe even make it more complex if I wanna get more data and I have a lot of core hours. Got it. Kill that and just see what's going on here. Launcher. Yep, still estimating. You would think that an AI algorithm would be able to estimate this pretty quickly. Anyway, since I'm impatient and I don't like looking at spinny hourglass things. Let me just go show you a what results look like.
think this one's got results. By the way, you can do multiple simulations in the same modeler environment. So in this case, I did a mechanical study and then I did a, a thermomechanical study. And many of our customers will do multiple different simulations using the same piece of CAD because they want to know how uh, an engineering component will behave under mechanical stresses or thermal stresses or in the near future, uh, EM, fluids, you know, other types of physics. Feedback, I think all these feedback, this is going okay. too slow. There's one question in the chat, Ian. And which okay. is, is there a way to estimate the accuracy of the results? That's that's something that we're working on. That's the the guided engineering, a part of the guided engineering uh, effort that we're doing. Because many times an engineer doesn't know how fine the mesh should be. Uh, so the way to, to handle that problem is to you know, look at how engineers are setting up a mesh and figuring out what they consider a good mesh or good results. So we'll help estimate the accuracy as, as well as the, uh, the runtime. So here's what those results look like. This was from that mechanical study. And uh, we can look at the deformation. In this case, it was this was a thermal study, so these things were expanding and contracting. And then if we want to, we can go to the Jupyter Notebook that contains all of the simulation data. There are 10 simulations here. And uh, this, you can create a, a Python script to go in and look at all the data, extract values, create a, a table that you can then use to, to train AI. So any questions about the tool here? Hey, um, this is Jeremy. Uh, I might, if you, if, if you allow me, uh, talk about automatic mesh refinement for the accuracy of the results. Yeah, go for it. Um, I, I don't think it's already in, in available in, in the web platform. But through the scripting, then you can get this automatic mesh refinement. So eventually you will run once and then there's an algorithm that they will estimate the errors and then it will refine locally where you know, the errors are, are higher. So until two or three or four uh, steps, then your results should be accurate enough for any engineering purpose. Awesome, thanks for that. By the way, Jeremy is one of our Brainiacs that makes the solvers happen, writes a bunch of awesome algorithms. And he also has his on scale hat. I need a haircut, so that's why I'm wearing my on scale hat all the time. <laughs> Any other questions? Is there like a predefined script, for example, if you start Jupyter, would you be able to have a predefined script where you can load all the results and run your automated AI pipeline, so to speak? Yep. Yep. There's an API for that. You can share scripts. You can share data, too. The only thing that we don't have is in that Jupyter notebook, what we're working on is to make this more general. Right now, it's a very closed off environment. You only have access mm -hmm. to your data and the, the libraries that we make available to you, but pretty soon it'll, it'll work more like uh, the SageMaker uh, Jupyter Notebook where you can import your own, you, you can import other like cloud APIs for training AI, for example. Got it. We had one question from another one. What are the optimization methods available presently? Right now, there's there's no optimization inherent in the simulation studies. However, uh, you can use whatever optimization routines you like from Python. 
We also have a MATLAB toolbox, so you can run uh, optimization using any of the, the MATLAB toolbox optimization routines. So it's all done by uh, scripting. Mm -hmm. I think I'm also sharing the uh, GitHub repo in the chat, if anyone is interested. Yep, it's all open source. Maybe someone can check if that's the correct one. I think so. Let's see, may I? Yeah. One scale. Yeah, this is this is the one. Let's see. Yeah, this is the Python based one, which is NumPy. So yeah, this one should work for you. There you have a sim API script. So you can just cut and paste that into your uh, project and follow along here. Do you have kind of a case study or maybe step-by-step -step instruction how people would run their own simulation study and then train AI, an AI algorithm on it? Actually, I think this, this uh, repo will do it for you. Okay, cool. I thought you have any other resources, but the repos, I think, could start. All right. Any other questions? I think if people have any questions, they might reach out to you either via LinkedIn or via email if they want to. Sure. Yeah. Happy to do it. Cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Joseph.